How were California estuaries created? And what are the things that govern their opening and closing, closing under natural circumstances? Our premise was that these different formation conditions and shorter term processes naturally create a range of closure conditions. Now this is where we need to just stop and, and let that sink in for a minute. A range of closure conditions. Coastal estuaries in California are not only open and closed. There's a whole lot in between what you might define as open and closed. You can sort of see how all of this works together. This is a prograding coast over here. Um, Biona could be, um, but it has some, some limitations to it. So we'll call it a, a, a large, uh, low gradient watershed. The wave exposure is to the west. So remember, we described that as being high wave exposure here in California. So again, we get good wave exposure. We'll come back to this map in a bit. This is a map of the wetlands of the biome watershed, the current wet biome watershed. And since we're here, we're, we're right about, where are we, right about here, mm -hmm. right? Um, interesting thing, while we're doing the historical ecology of the Biona watershed, you don't find a lot of references to Biona Creek. And the reason for that is, it was very short. It was about from here to here. Because this was the Cienega, this huge, big, marshy thing, right? Freshwater wetlands, alkali meadows, wet meadows, etc. the Cienega. And this was the extended Biona marsh, etc. swamp, uh, various words for it. And the actual creek was really this short little spot right down at the base of the hill here, um, factoid to take home. But exposure, purpose here though, is exposure is high. And the estuary space itself is hydraulic, uh, meaning that the short-term dynamics are really going to be determined by the amount of wave and water action that occurs to you. Okay, moving those sediments around. Now this set of pictures is really important because it takes, and it's by uh, Tony Orm and uh, uh, Palacios Fest, is a la the last name. I think the paper's 2003 or something like that. Upper left, 7,000 years before present. And you go 2,000 years, 5,000 years before present, 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, 1,200. Okay? And so what you see is this slow filling in of the Biona Bay, essentially, over time. And back there, that's inherited space probably, but slowly it fills in with these sediments. And you can see about three to 4,000 years ago, it basically turns into hydraulic space because there is this spit that goes across and closes it in, sort of like what Morro Bay almost looks like, right? So it's gone through that phase. And this here is a hydraulically defined opening. If you wanted to go something that was open to the ocean and fully tidal all the time, you'd need to go back about 4,000 years. So, our model predicts frequent closure. It's terraced, but part of a prograding system. Large size, okay, if you include the Yellow River, it's large size. If you don't, it's a little bit smaller. Uh, high exposure, hydraulic system. And this is our generalized model for that. Some of the time it should be perched. Most of the time it should be closed, and when it does open, it opens really good down to the low, in the, in the low, uh, low tide area, the low inner tide. Okay, so that's our prediction that we apply to every set of watersheds that share those, uh, those conditions. So the bar should develop at low, low tide, and it is never, quote unquote, open by our definition, which is still two meters of water at low, low time. So we went and looked through, and this is, when I say we here, there's a rather large cast of people that did all of this, um, including some very talented uh, uh, graduate students at uh, USC and, and at, uh, at Cal State Northridge. Um, we start looking at the maps. Now, here's a pluck. So I'm in the Spatial Sciences Institute at, at USC. It's just the fancy word for being a geographer, okay? Um, space. It's about space. We get more attention when we call ourselves spatial scientists. Um, you know, geographers, they think you're going to memorize the capital of North Dakota. When you say you're a spatial scientist, they're like, oh, can we collaborate? <laughs> um, but, you know, 
we generally tend to be really kind of excited about maps. Um, so this was a great, great project. And so we start back here. Um, this is um, 1839. This is a map from the Bancroft Library in Northern California. And this is called a decennio, which is a hand-drawn map that defined the limits of a land grant, of a Mexican landholder, okay? And even though they're hand-drawn, and they're going to use the north there and whatnot, they've got some odd features to them, they do have quite a bit of information. When you get them digitized at high resolution, you zoom in and whatnot, there's actually something that identifies that this is a big, huge clump of willows. Oh, interesting. Um, and, uh, and the, you know, Estero, this is the bay, etc. And so we start putting these things together. We put them into what's called a geographic information system, also known as GIS, which is just the fancy word for computerized map, and start overlaying them one on top of the other. And so here is the detail of the coast chart, the T-sheet, remember the T-sheets? The coast chart from 1876. And L up there, that is the lake. That's the coastal lake. It was between a set of dunes on the coast here and a set of dunes inland from them. This D, that stands for delta. This is actually a flood tide delta for when there was tidal action that would bring sediments in and deposit here. This is the salt pan that you see birds on at Bayona. Still there, okay? I, this is a little bit of an impoundment. FW, this is more fresh water, um, a little pond, et cetera, et cetera. And so we go and we digitize all this, put it in the computer so that we can overlay these features, assign them values, assign them certainty. How certain are we of the habitat type? How certain are we of the habitat location? And one thing you can see here, this little thing here is not very large. <laughs> In fact, it's quite small. And so the question is, did this flow? Well, this would be consistent with us saying opens in the low inner tidal, but does it close? So we go back and we start reading the newspapers. Around, of course, this is now so easy. They're all digitized. They're online. If you have the right access, you can go read the paper. So you're back reading the, the Los Angeles Times in, in the 1880s. Um, you're like, Bayana, tell me everything about Bayana. Um, what do we find? Bayana, a small narrow lake at the point where La Bayana Creek debouches into the ocean. Debouches. Couldn't put that in the LA Times today. Um, it is a true lake, for although it lies close down upon the sand of the beach, a well defined earth formation encircles it and proves conclusively that its water is not drawn by seepage from the sea. Behind in the dunes, they describe this elsewhere, uh, there stretch away for miles the low marshlands of the Sentinella Ranch. La Bayona Creek comes down through this marsh, and in the rainy season, the creek breaks through the sand hills. That's the inner set of dunes, and if you've ever volunteered at Bayona, that's the ones where now they've got uh, um, uh, Elsa Gunna Blue Butterfly and all that sort of stuff, right? The inner set of sand dunes breaks through, and the waters overflow into the lake, and then find outlet to the ocean, okay? That starts painting a very different picture than what we even have right now. You know, this was a closing system, and half the year, probably at least, it was closed. And these, that inner dune system served to retain water inside this big, and if you go back and look at the, the old literature, it's described as the Bayona Swamp, the stuff inland. So that outer part was the bay, and inland from that was the swamp, or what do they call it in here, the marshlands. Some places, as you, you know, there's descriptions about this also because they were deciding where to put the, um, the sewer line from downtown to the ocean, you know, the beginning of Hyperion, right? There's this big discussion about where they should put that. And the route that went through Bayona wasn't so good because they described it as being quicksand, right? Very wet, very high water table. So you start looking through the maps. This is an irrigation map. California being California, people wanting to grow things, irrigation is very important, there are some great maps. That looks like a little lake down there at the end. That's not something that's open to the ocean. 1880, Hall's Irrigation Map. You only get a nice, big, healthy opening of the ocean when you have the new piers constructed in 1887. Uh, now, why are the new piers out of Bayona? Because the boosters of the day wanted Bayona to be San Pedro. There was a big fight and lots of ink spilled between Pedro and Bayona. Which one is going to be the port? 
Which one is it? So they built this, and there's descriptions in the LA Times of the incredible amount of sand that they had to move to build this thing, you know, and the width through which they had to go, and how they had to shore that up in order to make Bayona into a fully titled weapon. Of course, they weren't calling it that then, they were calling it a port, right? To make Bayona into a port. So you can look at other sources. Um, this is uh, 1890, it's a picture from Bayona. Uh, duck hunting scene near Santa Monica. What's interesting here, bulrushes, not pickle weed. Pickle weed is what you would see if you had a fully title to the ocean all the time kind of oil. You don't because bulrushes are much happier with much lower salinity. And all the docks and everything. So they were, oh, this place was not a low pickle weed mark. It was a swamp with a heavy, heavy freshwater influence with periodic opening to the ocean through a relatively small channel that provided some saltwater influence and gave us this instead of typha, instead of uh, cattails, but still not a fully tidal blah, blah, blah kind of wetland. And we look and you can see even after things are open, you can go through and look at the remnants of this. This is the 1905 map of alkali soils in Los Angeles. Uh, from UCLA Special Connections. And you can see there's now this nice jetty open thing here. They call this the lagoon, et cetera, et cetera. But you can see the remnants. Remember this shape? Wasn't that kind of the willow grove? Yeah. Right? So the shapes of things sort of come through again as you look. The, the, the earth doesn't always completely forget, or should I say we're not always completely successful at wiping away the remnants of the natural system that came before us on this planet. And so you can often go through and you find, we've done these projects, historical projects in Ventura County and the San Gabriel River and whatnot. We find that you go and you look at a golf course and you find a water feature on a golf course and lo and behold, that was a freshwater lake back in 1880. It was the low spot, it was there and now it's incorporated into a golf course as a water feature. Right? Things have a way of, of keeping their input. We also have the soils map. Uh, this is uh, Nelson's 1919 soils map again, and so we can go and interpret these shapes that we have, and also the, the wetland soils on the other side, there's the Baldwin Hills that we're in right now, these low wetland soils are still there underneath in 1919, of, and they're sort of the last places that get developed, because we can see them, we zoom in on the Bayona, and we can see how the soils have been influenced by these former wetlands that were there. So, long story short, we put all that stuff together, assign things with certainty, and there's an art to this as well. You decide at the end of the day what you have to call things. And we, the other part that I haven't described in here is one of my jobs in this project was to go through all of the herbarium records uh, for Los Angeles County and figure out which ones of them were in the Bible watershed and which ones of them were associated with which wetland conditions. Now, herbaria, if you've never been, is a place where botanists put all their pressed plants. So people do still press plants. I don't know if anybody remembers this, but people do still, botanists. Uh, they go out and collect a voucher specimen of a plant, they press it and they dry it, and it can stay for 100, 150 years properly curated in a museum for plants, which is an herbarium. And now those records are starting to be put online, so you can search for them much more easily than you used to. And so I developed lists of plants that were in the plant museums uh, for these different parts of the um, of the uh, watershed. And the interesting thing here is that the things that you would expect to find in a fully open tidal system are not found in Biota until after it's open to the ocean. Cord grass would be the key thing there. Of course, there's a big debate, and it was not there prior to it being artificially jetted over to the ocean. Now, does that mean it wasn't there? I can't say that for sure because absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. But it's consistent with the rest of the story that we have here, which is the full tidal salt marsh plant species were not there until we start opening this place up to the ocean. And so this would have been our late 1800s uh, opening to the ocean with the implication, and we describe this as being brackish to saltwater marsh because it would have had a heavy freshwater influence 
and for much of the year would not have had a tidal connection. So we said, you know what? That's pretty consistent with what we predicted. Um, a system much different than what I think anyone not specializing in and researching this topic would imagine. Because we think of, you know, tides come right up by Yonah Creek now. That is a new thing. 1887 on. That's when that started happening. Okay? And so many of the things that we may take for granted as being natural down there are not natural. And the reason to think about it is how do the natural processes actually influence how well you can maintain things on this landscape? So why does this matter? So if you didn't believe me already, so I've tried to tell you what's the conceptual model, give you a conceptual model. Do the data fit the conceptual model for one place? I think they do. Now, I want to tell you why I think it matters. Why does it matter that we recognize that coastal estuary, the estuaries in California had all of these different closure states and that those closure states changed over time? I think I got six things to tell you. First, closure keeps the water table high and any kind of closure, these various types of closure, which promotes wetland and riparian habitat upstream and on the inland side of those estuaries. And you can see what happened when we did Bolsa Chica. This area in here used to be, had a higher water table. Once they put in the full tidal opening to restore Bolsa Chica, those water tables started going down. Now they've continued, there's a more recent picture, and they've started putting tidal water into there. But big. So I'll leave it right there for a moment. Um, we'll get back to that. Second, closure keeps channels still and produces a lot of fish. It's actually really good for fish to have a closing estuary in the summertime in California. Because the tides in California are not like the East Coast, where a lot of the textbooks were written about what's good for estuaries. Because our tides have a lower peak and a higher peak. They're actually out more than tides on the East Coast. Port of California. So if you have closure, you actually end up, for those species that are adapted to it, and there are many adapted to that closure, those channels are full, and they're busy, and they're productive, instead of being, some of them, open, uh, empty of water during those, uh, those tidal periods. Closure provides habitat for now rare species. Now, they didn't used to be rare, of course, because we had all these closing estuaries up and down the coast. Now they are. Tidewater goby, southern steelhead. Now you say, wait a minute, southern steelhead doesn't care. Southern, southern steelhead does very well in closed estuaries in the juvenile stage. Very well. Um, tidewater goby actually requires closing estuaries for its life cycle and persistence. And some of these places in San Diego County where we've been restoring coastal wetlands by turning them into full tidal, we've been eliminating tidewater goby populations in a place in their range that has actually the highest genetic diversity is, is a tidewater goby geneticist. That's why he has been in every single coastal estuary from about the tip of Baja up to San Francisco looking for gobies. There are also these fascinating things that you've never seen or heard of before, <laughs> sea slug, that are specifically adapted to a opening and closing estuary cycle. This is a, called Aldaria, it's a sea slug. It's exclusively found in coastal California. Its life cycle is adapted to closure. They have dispersive larvae that, that go out when the estuaries are open. And then they have sedentary larvae that crawl when the estuaries are closed. So they, the larvae of the sea slug changes its behavior based on whether the estuary is open or closed. Right? And this is a unique California species. And there are other things that go along with it. Retaining that water, having the riparian habitat, you know, fly catchers and Pacific garter snake, all the inland side of that. Once you turn something into a fully open system, and you lower the water table, and you don't have the backing up in the right area growth, there's a whole suite of species that go away from that. And there's some argument that clapper rails in Southern California actually were found in these closing systems. Uh, and that uh, the pickleweed grew quite tall when exposed to fresh water. We know that. This is what the studies show us. It grows really hard. We'll tell you all about that. Um, grows well, provides the cover necessary, uh, and you would have this species, which is on the endangered species list in some of these places. I know it was here in Bayona. It was described in 1912 as being in Bayona, a common resident on salt and brackish marshes near the coast, 
but becoming scarcer every year, 1912. Fresh water makes salt marsh species more productive. Those species aren't out there because they love the salt. Most plants hate salt, right? And really hate salt. And when you give them a little fresh water, they grow. And they germinate. And they do all sorts of good things. So this is an illustration of this from Joy Zedler's work down in San Diego, uh, looking at Spartina. The one in the middle, the bar in the middle, is um, height, density, stem length, during a season when it got flooded with fresh water. Okay, so you think of Spartina as being a salt water plant. When you give it some fresh water, boom. So there's actually some real benefits to have a system that has this dynamic fresh water uh, element to it. Closure also helps protect beaches from bacteria during the summertime. Now this is a very selfish, human-centered thing. But we happen to have about, you know, 10 million people around here who like to go to the beach. And they like to go to the beach in the summertime. And in fact, closing summer, estuaries being closed in the summer is going to reduce, because the estuaries, I'm sorry, are going to be full of bacteria. A, because there's you know, runoff from things that we as humans do, and B, because there are the birds and other animals that poop in the estuary and there's going to be plenty of bacteria. So if we want to keep the beaches clean during the summertime, closing estuaries are not actually a bad idea. And natural closure patterns are easier to maintain. This is that bad Akita's example. They're spending a lot of money going in and dredging out this restoration because of the accumulation of sediment. And we'll go back to Bolsa Chica for a second here. This is Bolsa Chica in 1874 on the tea sheet. It was not open at the southern end. It was open a little bit way up over here, maybe occasionally in the mid, uh, the mid intertidal, but not a full, you know, tidal uh, wetland by any stretch of imagination. And this is what we turned it into. Awful. And the, the uncharitable version of this slide. So, <laughs> <laughs> says, where did the money come to do this? Well, it came from the harbor for mitigating for loss of, you know, deep, full tidal habitat in the harbor. Which, if we recall, wasn't even full tidal habitat because it was closed in the subtitle, okay? So we mitigated for loss of a harbor, which was a creative habitat, by going to another wetland and creating a harbor. That's a harbor. Why do you think there's dolphins in it? Because it's turned into a harbor. Dolphins never used to be in the Volta Chica, but they're there now because, and, so, here's how this went. Uh, we're going to build something, okay? We're going to build it, we're going to spend a lot of money, we're going to build it, we're going to be really happy about it, we're going to take the money from the forest, we're going to build it. Okay, we open it up, boom! What year is this? 2007, right after it opens? This little spit starts growing right here. I could have told you that, okay? This is 2009. They've already gone in and dredged it mm. once. And they paid for that out of Montrose settlement money. Oh my gosh. Okay, because there's actually not enough money in the endowment, as far as I can tell, for Bolsa Chica to pay to do the dredging indefinitely. So they're looking for other sources of money to do that. Right? Here's 2010. Oh my god. Oh, whoopsies. So what's it doing? It's doing exactly what I told you it would do. <laughs> it's trying to close up because this system does not have the power. Even though it's a big tidal prism, does not have the power to keep it professionally open in the ocean. And so here it is in 2011. The only, and this looks like it's being dredged. Yes, it's being dredged again. The only reason it's staying open is every other year, it's been spending $3.3 million. For the explicit goal that the tidal range not become muted. And that's technical words for not closing in the low tidal, mid tidal, and high tidal, or closing. And that there is no contingency for what would happen if it closed and they didn't have the money to open it back up again by dredging. Wow. And that's in the newsletter. It never, everybody accepts this as just the way things ought to be. So this is mid dredge, April 22nd, 2011. Right? And if you zoom back out from there, that's what they're doing there. All this sediment, they're in there sucking the sediment out, and here's a tube probably that goes out and put it on the beach. So, to mitigate for a harbor, we built a harbor, 
that we then go in and spend three and a half million dollars every other year to take the sand from the beach and put it back onto the beach because that's not where the harbor wants to be. That's expensive. And need I be snarky? Stop the camera. Um, <laughs> be snarky for a minute. These are the same people who would have you turn your life upside down to stop global warming. Geoengineer it, whatever you want to do, put solar plants in the desert because we got to stop global warming. Yet you're going to design a restoration that requires yearly or every other year massive energy expenditure to keep it running. It makes no sense to me. I'm sorry. It just does not make sense to me. Except they get paid. That's why. <laughs> I didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> so, science, so I, I couldn't help myself. And I started expressing an opinion here at the end. Science, though, is not normative. Science can't tell you what you want to do with this this watershed or another watershed or whatever or whatnot. All we can do is say, this is how we think it's working. This is the model that predicts what's going to happen. These are the reasons you might want to do this or might want to not do this. It doesn't actually make those value judgments for you. You know, I have some ideas. How about this one? How about a definition? Maybe this is science. Artificially jetting a weapon open to the ocean is not restoration if it was not historically open to the ocean all the time. Call it what you want, and I've had this discussion with people on various science panels, and they're perfectly willing to admit, oh, this is not going back to historical conditions. I'm like, this is going back to 4,000 years ago. Well, well, it's enhancement. Okay, fine. It's not a restoration, it's enhancement. I can live with that. If you think it's enhancement, let's be honest about it. But it ain't restoration, not by my definition. How about Southern California estuaries 500 years ago probably wouldn't have complied with the Water Quality Act, Clean Water Act? Because they closed, they were sumps, they were stinky, they were full of bacteria and all sorts of stuff. And to think that we need to take every watershed, every wetland, and make it comply with standards that, that it in its native state could not maintain, to me, is a, is a ferocious boondoggle. So maybe restoration should be designed to work with natural processes. <laughs> yeah, that's the you know, revolutionary, right? How about that? But it ain't science, I know that. How about it's a good idea to keep landscape features that have been there for over 100 years and stable on the landscape, like a dune or a salt pan or a tidal channel that's been there for 115 years. Wouldn't that seem to be a reasonable way, place to start, at least? And a first principle. That's what I've always done in the restorations that I've worked on. I've only worked on upland restoration, I will admit, coastal sage scrub, etc., butterflies, blah, blah, blah. But that's a principle we could talk about. The thing that you all want to talk about, I'm sure, is this one, right? <laughs> this is the current plan for restoring bio weapons. Is that, has everyone seen this picture? No. Is there anyone who has not seen this picture? People. All right, so let's walk through this. So this is in yeah, thank you. So this is in the most recent technical memo to the science committee or something. Um, so the creek comes down here, and these black things are new berms that will replace the channel of Biona, of Biona Creek, and it digs out this whole area. That salt pan that's been there for 100 some years, right? That's gone. The dunes that people have been working on to restore for 25 years, that's underneath the berm. Um, and all this sort of gets dug out so that it can be a natural, <laughs> functioning, full tidal wetland. And my opinion, I know that my colleague Dave Jacobs shares this, is that this is sort of a tragic misinterpretation of the Holocene record, the, the historical record, um, that at this point in time, that channel actually serves a function ecologically in terms of keeping pollution out of the wetlands. Because now, if this happens, everything that gets into Bionic Creek ends up... So what happens when you slow down here? You widen it out, there's no constraints. That means anything that's in the creek is going to deposit there. From bowling balls to, to, to uh, shopping carts to plastic bags. Well, there's not going to be plastic bags anymore. Um, <laughs> The idea that this will stay, and, and this is, we will also have action coming in from this direction as well, and deposition, 
like we had at, uh, at Matakitos. And I've talked to the people, some of the people promoting this project, and they said, yeah, we'll have to dredge it. We dredge by already. Well, yeah, we'll just dredge it. Okay? Um, this will probably be pretty substantially reworked uh, through, through the powerful action of the stream coming down here, and may even flatten all of this out in a way that's inconceivable by those designing it at the moment. You might, ironically, even end up with less subtitle habitat. Because Bayana Creek right now is subtitle habitat. If you take away the edges of the creek and you allow the power of this watershed to work these set into it, it's going to flat. Do I have models that show you this is going to happen? No. This is reasonable supposition after long conversation between colleagues on what's likely to happen here. And from the perspective of the historical condition in Bayona, this gets us back 4,000 years, but it doesn't get us anywhere near the system that we lost. And my view is that it would be much smarter to keep the channel and allow water to come in from the channel where you want it to go, when you want it to go there, and take, frankly, a much more active management approach to promote species that we want to promote on this landscape. Uh, we can talk about what some of those things might be. I don't want to, to, to divert the conversation with my fantasies about what one could do here. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Uh, I think that would be a good thing for everyone to talk about. And one of the reasons for this is that historically, the surfaces at Bayona were high in the tidal or even above high tide. And, that's, and now that you understand that things can get perched and dune dammed, that's how those things that look so high could be wet. Because it wasn't open exactly to the ocean all the time. And you know, this area over here, yes, we know that's a lot of fill right now. Um, it does serve a function as well, which is at the time when that turned into fill, everything around it got developed. And it became a little bit of a refuge for the insects and, and uh, other small creatures of the lower watershed there. So there's actually quite a bit of interesting invertebrate biodiversity in that area. Now maybe there are places where you want to carve it down and add some, you know, a freshwater wetland or a treatment wetland or something, because the plan here doesn't actually account for, as far as I can tell, cleaning up the water before it gets into this at all. Nope. Not at all. And probably it would be, I would think, you could set up a way to use some of these you know, properties, um, get some water out of the channel, do something like what they did down in the Dinigas Gap, where they have a treatment wetland that's outside of the main channel. Because during the first flush, I don't want that water going into my coastal watershed because of the city that we are and the amount of pollution that's in it. Yes, I know that then it goes into the bay, but frankly, that's better um, than it going into, into this wetland. Into there are lots of opportunities here. I hope this gave you an idea of a different way of thinking about it than some of the ones that maybe have been presented so far. I encourage you, if you're interested in the science of any of this, there's a series of reports um, on the website. This is my personal page on your Wildlands Group website. There's a section in there called Historical Ecology. You can get a link to a map of the historical wetlands of the bio watershed a report on the historical ecology of the Bayonne watershed, a report on the historical ecology of the San Gabriel River watershed, a report on the Ventura River watersheds, all this sort of stuff, to get a sense of an appreciation for the historic landscapes that we have. And maybe that can help us all, I hope, frankly, come to some different ideas about how we might do the restoration for that land that people thought so hard to protect down the Bayonne. So thank you for coming, I really appreciate it. And you recontour, there's all the sediment in the world. They're going to recon. It's going to recontour whatever you do. It's going to, you know, coming fast out of that uh, out of that that creek. You know, your big storm is going to move things around. And 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 it happens right now. And Dave's actually been down and you know seen that and walked up. You know, there is a tidal bar that create is created at the mouth of Bayonne Creek. Um, so you can just point to you know pictures. Here it is. That's what's happening in Matakitos. What's different? Kristen? I'd like to hear a little bit about the fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, 
I, I wrote a paper once that they claimed we should never have type conversion uh, in restoration. And type conversion is where you take one kind of habitat and you turn it into a completely different kind of habitat. And that would be sort of my first principle for going in here, is look at the things that are there and stable and working, and go from there instead of having an abstract idea about we need to restore a certain kind of function and everything then flows from that. I think the current design is sort of flows from the idea that we must have a fully titled wetlands, and this is how we're going to get it. Um, I would like to see, uh, I would rather spend the $300 million uh, that it would take to do some of this work on uh, Mm -hmm. some more active management, you know, tidal gates, uh, being able to flood things at the right time of year to create a feeding zone for lease terms, for example. Uh, because one of the, you know, one of the reasons that lease terms are getting hammered is because they have bad fish years and they have to go out far away and the crows eat all their eggs. They do better when there's a lot of food. And so I would much rather than have this abstract sort of functional idea of we must have this type of wetland and it's going to function and everybody's going to be happy with functions to say if we want to see specific species, we need to do things that are good for those species. And it might be, and it might be a lot of active management, tide gates and whatnot, but you know, I could probably endow a staff of, of you know, 15 with that money to manage this stuff in perpetuity if we took an approach of, of really concentrating on the species and particular habitats that we want to create or restore here rather than this general idea. And I know because I've had these discussions, the idea is this thing that they're going to build is going to be resilient to climate change, it's going to be resilient to sea level rise, and you're not going to, it's going to function without having to be managed. And I think A, that's poppycock, and B, it's incredibly expensive, um, and, and we could do so much more for the species that we have right now. And for sea level rise, what do we want more than to have some levees there to keep a higher ocean out of the wetlands we just spent so much money, so money to restore? I just, uh, so those kinds of things are what I'm talking about. Well, so great presentation, thank you. Um, I know you're speaking on your own behalf, not on behalf of Los Angeles Audubon, but given that this is such an important bird area, and I know it's also a very sensitive topic, can you give us a high level sense of um, what role the organization might play moving forward in looking at the EIR? Sure, they're working with the um, The board looked at these plans and uh, drafted a letter to the Bay Restoration Foundation slash commission uh, that expressed some concerns.